It's a pleasure to be back with you again. My name is Ibrahim Sheikh, I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live to our international audience from Farah Medical Campus in Amman, Jordan. The topic for today will be sphenoid sinusitis with multiple cranial nerve pulses. It's a clinical, radiological, operative pathological correlation. This is uh, downtown Amman, center of Amman. And this is the Roman amphitheater and some of the stairs in the old soaps of Amman. So if you have a property there in the center of Amman, you'll be rich. So whenever you are in the center, you will gain a lot. Sphenoid sinus is in the center of the skull. So it is the central bone of the skull, and everything is built around it. So this is the skull as a whole. This is just showing the sphenoid uh, a bone, which is composed of body, a lizard wing, greater wing, and two legs, uh, the so-called telegoid plates. It is surrounded by very important structures. <coughs> and to deal with the bee with the sphenoid you have to know the relationship with all these important pituitary <coughs> nerves, front, uh, optic nerves, frontal loops, cavernous sinus with its contents, the bee canal, the sphenopalatine artery, sphenopalatine ganglion. So this is it. This is the sphenoid <coughs> a body. It's just like a bird. This is the head. This is the body. These are the wings. Large wing, a small wing. And the body which has two legs, which is the median and lateral tergoid plates. And inside the body is the sphenoid sinus. So this is it again. Sphenoid bone, wings and the body. And the way through it to the uh, the nose. Cella tersica is sitting on the body, on the top of the body. This is the body. On top of it is the uh, cella tersica with the pituitary, and on both sides you have the <coughs> cavernous sinus with the carotid artery inside, with the venous channels inside, third nerve, fourth nerve, first division of uh, trigeminal, second division, third division, and the sixth nerve. So third, fourth, and sixth. The only one which is really inside the cavernous sinus is the sixth. Or the third, the fourth, and the first division of trigeminal are on the wall of the cavernous sinus. B2 and B3 are not inside the cavernous sinus. Again, this is the cavernous sinus as you look at it from the front, <coughs> this is the sinus, and this is the endoscopic view of the sinus, which is full of usually of septi. Lateral view of the sinus, the center of the skull, with the frontal lobes above, cella on top of the body, and the cavernous sinus. Larger view of the same thing, between the gland and the cella, on top of the body of the sphenoid. Inside the body is the sphenoid sinus. And the pattern of air pneumatization in the sphenoid sinus is variable. This is almost lack of pneumatization. This is pneumatization in the anterior part. This is pneumatization in most of the parts. So that's why we get different kinds of uh, cell latency. Pneumatization starts at the age of one to two and a half years. You start having pneumatization in your uh, sphenoid sinus, and it's complete by the age of 10. Of course, this has an implication of transnasal transmural surgery in kids. So this is the sphenoid sinus with multiple septi. This is the pituitary gland, and so on. Same thing. And we have to appreciate that these sphenoid sinus may have a large lateral extension, the so-called lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus. And sometimes the sphenoid sinus also radiation goes into the anterior clinoid process like this. The anterior clinoid process is totally irradiated. Look at the many septi here. And here is the foramen rotundum, here is medium canal. So the relationship between both is very important for the endoscopists. <coughs> There's a relationship between the ethmoid and the sphenoid. 
until tomorrow, middle of tomorrow, still tomorrow. So that is very much related to this phenomenon. And these are the kinds of pattern of both relationship. And this is the radiology, different radiology pattern of the relationship of the ethmoid with this phenomenon. So we know now the sphenoid sinus anatomy. What kind of lesions can we have there? Uh, most of the lesions are inflammatory, two thirds maybe. One third and miscellaneous is neoplasm or miscellaneous. We come to one topic, which is the mucosal. Of course, the commonest with the air sinuses is the frontal, followed by the ethmoid, followed by the maxillary, followed by the So our topic for today is very rare. To have mucosal of a sphenoid is extremely rare, especially if it is associated with multiple cranial nerve pulses. What kind of inflammatory lesions do we see? You may have single or multiple organisms, you may have bacteria, you may have fungal uh, involvement, bacterial mycosis, mycosis, aspergillosis, etc. The main thing in the mucosal problem, which may turn into pyocele if it's not infected, is obstruction of the sinus system. So there is the sinus with this epithelium, ostium is closed, secretions continue, blocked, so they will accumulate and they will get secondary bacterial infection, purulent material, and then it will expand and cause bony erosion. Uh, which countries are famous for the sphenoid sinus mucosal? Asia in general, China, Japan, North Af Africa, and Middle East. Look at the patterns of this mucosal of the sphenoid sinus. Look at this one. So they can get really extensive. <coughs> Look at here, the destruction of the walls. You may pass this as nothing, but it may be very important. So here, the lateral rhesus is involved. Look at the variation of the lateral rhesus. Again, the amount of bony destruction here. The relationship of the foramen rotundum with the maxillary division and the median canal, which carries the greater superficial through the nerve. And here is the same thing. <coughs> relationship between the foramen rotundum and the medially situated medial canal. Medial canal now is the landmark for the endoscopy. And I have always to mention that this endoscopy lies the future of neurosurgery. So many papers published about sphenoid sinus mucosal. Uh, not many, as I said, it is rare, but the ones I could collect up like this. Various papers. Mucosal involving anterior pyramid, as I said, because it, it is aerated uh, as part of the sphenoid sinus, and then you will get just the uh, mucosal in the anterior pyramid, and it will form the orbital apex syndrome or cavernous sinus syndrome. You make a fungal infection, and I want to share with you this patient of mine from Libya, 25 year old, with this extensive fungal infection going intracranially. Look at the hypertolerism, this is the pre op, and this is the post op. Another case of mine with this fungal infection. What time? Yes, we will get And here, this, uh, again, Iraqi gentleman with fungal uh, sinus infection complicated with the brain abscess. So it was aspergillosis. <coughs> and this is actually our pure stains in, in the lab. Uh, cases of fungal infection, they call it fungal bore. <coughs> because it's really like a ball, so it can go everywhere. <coughs> Again, fungal balls or fungal infection, and look at the black debris of the fungus. This is very invasive fungal sinusitis. And here, again, a ball, fungal ball causing visual disturbances. Same thing here, ethmoid sphenoid. Look at the bone destruction here and here. 
treatment, and it shows that the quantum cerebral DC will allude to this. But basically, to remember that amphotericin B is, uh, is important, and uh, recently, uh, hyperbaric oxygen. Of course, if the patient is diabetic or immunocompromised, you have to treat. <coughs> what is the ideology of this system of sinus mucosy? It really depends on the contents, because the content, whether it's mucus or infected with secretions, will cause biochemical consistency issues. All in all, low signal T1, high signal T2, and usually no rim of enhancement. But of course, there are uh, the odd things. So here you are, bony destruction. This is uh, a patient of mine, a recent patient of mine. But look at the pituitary, how much it is involved. The cell is totally destroyed. This is T2. And you can see that there is separation on ADS and uh, the rest of it, as you mentioned. Comes a question, how often does isolated remote sinus disease turn out <coughs> to be neoplasm? How often you have a Strenot sinus mucosid, but that does not cause simply by bacterial infection or by obstruction of the ostium. It is caused by more sensitive pathology. Let's see. You'll be surprised. Strenot sinus <coughs> neoplasm presenting as mucosid. So don't be misled by this is simply mucosid because it can be very nasty. And this is the idea of such meetings that we uh, shed a light on these cases that will interfere with the management. Carcinomas, papillomas, angiofibromas, etc. Pituitary tumors, meningiomas, other lesions other than tumor, trauma, foreign body, post op, post radiation, aneurysm of the carotid in the, uh, in the uh, cavernous sinus. Let's see. One of my cases, sinusal, uh, tumor, fibroma with the obstruction of the sinus. And the patient of mine from Sudan with this tumor blocking the sinus. This is pre-op, this is post-op. Sinus sinus carcinoma, angiofibroma, especially in children, Ewing sarcoma, This is the gel carcinoma, as we mentioned. Giant cell tumor. Even sarcoma, I mentioned it. Solitary fibrous tumor, reported in this series of three, three cases. Sinoid sinus chordoma, chordoma just centered in the chymus area. Multiple myeloma or single myeloma. I had about four cases of single myeloma in the clivus and this renal sinus. Cavernous hemangioma, just in the renal sinus. And rectumin sarcoma. You may have, oh, this is simple. This is mucosine. No, this is mucosine complicating rectumin sarcoma of the renal sinus. I heard something the other day. Why are you, Dr. Spare, presenting these rare cases? Because of this. You just, the, 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 the talk about common is common is nonsense. Common is common, yes, it comes at the top of the list, but you have to know the rest of the list. Clivus metastasis. Hodgkin lymphoma, who is the lymphoma man? He's not here today. <laughs> This can follow, the mucosid can follow head and neck radiation for various types of tumors. Uh, this was complicating uh, a case like this. <coughs> it can be complicated by simple things, not only tumors, but a polyp. It will obstruct the ostium and cause mucosid. Fibrous dysplasia, and I have a few cases obstructing the ostium. This is one of my cases. Look at this. Obstructing it completely. Obstructing the anterior clinoid, distorting the optic canal. Again, in an Iraqi patient. Lipoma, intraosseous, within the cavernous sinus. 
there are things that we don't think about it, and there's always a word of warning for the young generation. You look into the nose or the throat of somebody and see something dangling, you take it out, and then you have either sudden death or serious afflict, because you did not remember the red things. In Kefalosil and Meningosil, presenting through the nose. I have seen cases like this. Sinoid sinus mucosil caused by thrombosed intracavernous cardiac aneurysm. Who would think of this? It is there. This, these pathologies are there, but you are not thinking about it because you think common is common. Nonsense. Common is common in the way of thinking, top of the list, but I should know the list. Aneurysm, bilateral. Bilateral. Not single, bilateral. AV fistula. AV fistula within the sinoid sinus. Let's concentrate on the sinoid sinus mucus here. Symptoms. <coughs> this is very nice paper. Isolated sinoid sinus pathologies, the problem of delayed diagnosis. This is absolutely true. And when we come to the, our case, you'll see there's always delayed diagnosis because common is common. We don't think about the right things. That's why the sinoid sinus is called the silent sinus. It's not like the front or maxillary. Common thing in our emergency department, <coughs> you do this, you do this, oh, there's no sinusitis. No. Sinus sinus is deep. It will not give you the same thing like front or maxillary. But because you did not think about it, you will not diagnose it. Always delayed diagnosis. And who's responsible? GP, thermology, ENT, the pediatricians. And this is a good statement. Headlight and plain X-rays are not enough. Just to put the headlight, oh, there's nothing. Of course, there's nothing. You will not see pathology in the spinal sinus by putting the headlight on. What are the symptoms? Headache. Who among us never complained of headache? It's a common. And the common uh, say in the Arab world is that, oh, I had these usual headaches. Usual headaches. That affects all people and it is limited by one tablet of analgesia. This is very dangerous. Most of the brain tumors I have seen were like this. How many, oh, I used to have these headaches, but that's the usual headache that everybody complains of, and it is relieved by a simple analgesia, and it is caused by skull based tumor. So you may present with headache, you may present with visual, meaning vision, you may present with ocular palsy, then the nerve palsy and others, exothalamus, pituitary dysfunction, nasal obstruction, which is the very rare. <coughs> Papers about this. Isolated spinal sinus disease and overlooked cause of headache, which is absolutely true. And I would add another paper saying uh, isolated spinal sinus disease with a major sensitive carcinoma and overlooked cause of headache. <coughs> Where does the headache of the sinus sinus come from? Again, we just press here and there, we say no sinus sinus. It could be anywhere. It could be bifrontal, it could be one side, it could be frontal orbital, it could be occipital. What do you think of that? Occipital headache caused by sinus sinus. If you don't think about it, you <coughs> don't diagnose it. Diffused, generalized, retroorbital. Retroorbital, all perfect. Hemicranial looks like a, a <coughs> migraine or something. Bilateral consecutive blindness caused by mucosy. Blindness. Irreversible. That's why you should diagnose these cases. Don't say common is common. Blindness. Which nerve of the cranial nerves is mostly affected? There is debate. Is it the optic nerve or the third nerve? It's equal. Some people say it's optic nerve, some people say third, and so on. But this is a paper saying that they have bilateral blindness and it was irreversible. <coughs> Sphenoid sinus mucosil simulating the retrobulbar optic nerves. Decreased vision, a young person, a female, are oh, hysterical. Females are usually diagnosed as hysterical because they are refined creatures. We over over diagnose their their uh, refinement. Sphenoid sinus mucosil masquerading as retrobulbar optic nerve. These are papers. 
look at this going into the orbit. It will press on the optic nerve, cause ischemia, or infection, and the patient will have total loss of vision just because nobody diagnosed spinal sinus mucosal. Mucosal of the spinal sinus, a rare cause of reversible third nerve palsy. It is really there, and our case that we are going to present is exactly the same. This is before surgery, this is after surgery. But this is a paper, not of ours. We will discuss it when we come to our case. Isolated spinal sinus mucosal presenting as third nerve palsy. How we think of this? I want you to criticize yourself and say, do you really think of spinal sinus causing this? <coughs> Which nerve? We said optic nerve is common, the other nerves, third is the commonest, and usually it is pupil and spare, meaning that the pupils are not affected. Third nerve palsy could be pupil sparing, could be pupil involvement. Sixth nerve palsy, fourth nerve palsy, or fifth. Why fifth? Because first division of the trigeminal is within the cavernous sinus. Second division is just in the floor, so any of these can come. Again, imagine yourself treating a patient who says, I have headache and I have numbness in my face. No, nothing. Hysterical. Case of isolated abuse and nerve palsy caused by spinoid sinus mucosal. Spinoid mucosal presenting with oculomotor nerve palsy and affecting the functions of trigeminal nerve. Features of this uh, the visual disturbances to uh, secondary to. Uh, isolated spinal sinus disease. Spinal mucosal with unusual pan hypopotism. Would you imagine this as a mucosal? And the patient has, in addition to the cranial nerve palsy, pan hypopotism. So what are the complications? Why are we presenting this? Because of fear of complications, because of fear of somebody missing the diagnosis and not being careful enough because common is common, rubbish. Common is common in the eyes and the head and minds of very superficial people who are not thinking, should not be in the medical field actually. Complications, orbital abscess, cavernous sinus thrombosis, compression of the telecolored artery, visual loss, meningitis, extradural abscess, subdural abscess, brain abscess. Are these cases real? Of course, this is one of mine, three-year-old, presenting with, with this brain abscess. Extracurral abscess. A paper with meningitis and a brain abscess. So this is real, this is not fictitious. Cavernous sinus thrombophilpitis, usually fatal. 80% of cases, they die simply because you did not think about mucosal. This very nice paper from the University of California, Davis Center Medical Center, with this cavernous sinus thrombophilopathy secondary to fungal infection. Look at this colored artery, thrombosed, compare it with this one. And because it is affected on the left side, there's ischemia. <coughs> so what's the treatment of these mucoseals? surgery basically, whether it is microscopic or endoscopic. I am a microscopic man, but surgery for this phenomenon could be very well endoscopic, and as I said, it is the future of neurosurgery. And the aim is to have an opening in this phenomenon, it is called marsupialization, and allow the drainage of, this is usually the case in Europe. In the States, they go a little bit aggressive, and they demand that you should remove the mucosal, which is really not practical. You may use image guiding, uh, navigation, any body from the navigation, from the muscles is the other side. Uh, you can use the navigation, you know exactly where you are. This is one of my cases, using the microscope, and <coughs> just making a check, say this is the cell, and this is to know where I am exactly. And the endoscopy, of course, you can actually reach from here, crystal line down to the foramen magnum. <coughs> this is the future of neurosurgery. And these endoscopists are, <coughs> I have to say, there are 
uh, friends of mine, I'm a friend of them. Uh, and, uh, we meet and discuss matters uh, frequently. And I am a member of the International Society of Pituitary Surgery, and that put you in direct contact with these people. We fight, we argue, but in with respect. Uh, everybody has his own opinion. And the major man in the pituitary is Ed Lowe's and uh, Osiko. Uh, and this is this is wife of Ed Lowe's, this is my wife. And here we are in various meetings. Approaches to this front sinus, you can go transnasal, you can go transceptor, you can go transteroid, which is a new, it is mainly endoscopic. Transnasal, first choice, but if you have a lateral rhesus, then you go with the transteroid. Papers, endoscopic, the range of pediatric, paranormal science, we will see. Pediatric. <coughs> so that to me for uh, this kind of lesion. Petrus apex, you can see it. We can only reach it through the uh, turgoid uh, fossa. Maxillary sinus, open the posterior of the maxillary sinus, you go to the pterygopalatine fossa, and from there you will reach the pubic rescuers. So, we'll come to our case. So, you know, sinus scientists causing multiple cranial nerve process. HM, 31 year old Jordanian, is a graphic designer. He resides in Norway. He lives there and he practices is a graphic design in Norway. He is the son of a famous general surgeon here in Jordan. And this case, uh, this case was back in December 2018, six months ago. Uh, he was treated at St. Elsewhere. We don't want to mention the hospital. That was why we call it St. Elsewhere. For two weeks, he complained of headache, severe. He started to develop some fever, generalized fatigue. He the around and he tab shoye on the sofa, and was showing that. So he was given empirical antibiotics without any investigations, without any examination. Diagnosis, a simple sinusitis secondary to flu. He was given antibiotics. After one week, he had right eye ptosis. Start to have double vision. He complained of facial pain and facial numbness because of B1, B2 involvement. And then he started to have nausea and vomiting, and he developed hematuria. Nothing in the past history had been selected to me as a child. Examining him, you will see a patient who is ill-looking. He's moribund, really ill. And he was shivering with fever. And what do we diagnose? Hematuria and shivering, UTI, immediately. Because it's common is common. He had neck rigidity. Nobody bothered to examine him. He had severe neck rigidity. He came sinus positive. He had meningitic sinus. This patient was going to die. Fever? Yes, he was feverish. General examination was normal. Upper and lower limbs had no weaknesses. He had no weaknesses in his arms or legs. We started treating him, and he was uh, CBC, etc. was well, everything was well except the platelets, low. And that was what would be severe infection, DIC kind of thing. So we did a few uh, images, and I would want to ask Dr. Rahoshe to present. <coughs> What was his CRP? Did you do a CRP? Yeah. It, it was done. It was high. It was high. It was done. It was high. 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 It was high.
I would like to welcome you all to this most uh, fruitful and prestigious uh, multidisciplinary neurosurgical conferences. I was organized by our friend Dr. Ibrahim Speyer. Uh, really, Dr. Ibrahim, I really thank you for, the, for your uh, continuous and uh, sustained effort in organizing such uh, conferences. How long have you been doing this? Dog years. Dog years. Uh, I will take a little bit. Can we have the images? Okay. Uh, I will take a little bit for two minutes away from uh, radiology and the neurosurgery, and then we'll come back. Okay. Now, uh, during my years at the medical school, I had two weaknesses. One was in uh, in the neuro surgery anatomy, neurosurgical anatomy, and the other one was in pathology and histology. Right? So back when I, wa I was trained in the American University in Beirut, I was wondering how Dr. Fuad Sami Haddad, which you know, or Dr. Speh now, how would he know, how, how would he know all the relation between the uh, pigment and the sphenopalatine uh, nerve and the uh, medicine, artery, how can you avoid such uh, very, very delicate structures? And uh, the other one, it was pathology and histology. How can a pathologist from a bunch of cells give me the diagnosis of grade three, poorly differentiated oligodendroglioma? But now, after, after attending well, such conferences, and believe me, I learned a lot. The other thing, the other point, uh, is uh, when I, I got married a little bit uh, at a late uh, age. I think Dr. Jalil, you know? Of course. You were 32, and then 10 years we were looking for the wife. So <laughs> became 42. Well, I, got the, I got married at the age of 32. Then my son, Abdullah, when he was young, he used to tell me, uh, Father, you, I mean, you, why, why do you attend? He used to cry and tell me, it seems that you are a, a good radiologist. Why do you attend? conferences and travel and attend conferences. Why do, why all this hassle? I used to tell him, look, look Abdullah, if, when he, when he was, if, uh, when he could understand what I was telling him, I told him, my son, knowledge has no limits. One goes to grave and keeps on learning. And that's what we are doing now. Okay, now, uh, as the doctor, As Dr. Ibrahim said, uh, sphenoid sinusitis is a very rare uh, disease. Now, uh, let me concentrate first of all on uh, on the uh, on the images that on the planes that we take in, in the neuroradiology. Uh, always we have to take we have some images, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, all of you can tell about. Everyone knows by now that this is the sphenoid, and this is the opacification of the sphenoid sinus. We'll come back to it. But always, please try to try to take uh, planes in, in different, uh, I mean, images in different planes. That is, that is uh, 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 sagittal, coronal, and axial images. Fine. Because uh, as you know that the uh, sphenoid sinus has intimate relationship with a lot of with a lot of, of uh, structures important structures such as the uh, cavernous sinus the carotid artery and uh, the optic chiasm, the uh, uh, supra orbital fissure and a lot of other lot of other uh, uh, structures okay and uh, what what can happen yeah what what can happen uh, in 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 in, uh, in the sphere in the sinuses? I mean, it can be like oozes. It can be very easy and it can be very difficult. Very easy in the sense it can be sinusitis, or it can be tumor, or it can be virus dysplasia. It can be uh, lymphoma. It can be anything. Because in the sinus we have, uh, of course, we have the uh, mucosa. We have the uh, ductal epithelium. We have uh, uh, the lymph, artery, vein, periosteum, and bone.
Okay, so coming now to our friend, this we know is Silas. One important thing, take home message from me, please, that differentiates between chronic sinusitis. I had sinusitis. Why well, didn't uh, give, proceed into a mucosil? One thing, he mentioned that obstruction of the ostium of the sinus, okay? The, there is the blockage of the drainage of the sinus into the nasal cavity. And that's what happens. The, the sphenoid sinus becomes uh, opacified. It expands. Okay, there's one bathroom. Okay, it expands. And as you see, because of the blockage of the ostium, it, uh, I mean, the, 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 the uh, mucosa of the sinus starts producing mu uh, mucus, and the mucus blocks the ostium, and the, the, uh, it becomes expansive. And if it's infected, if it's infected, it starts if going again uh, at uh, if, uh, uh, involving uh, surrounding uh, structures. Now there's only one one sign here of of uh, extra sinus uh, uh, infection uh, extension, which is the pneumocephalus. Of course, this patient wasn't given contrast during CT. Of course, my friend the man will uh, of course will show you the MRI images with the contrast and will show you the extension uh, beyond the uh, boundaries. And he will show you probably the meningitis and the uh, <coughs> the abscess and the edema in the surrounding structures. And uh, so this is the again, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank Uh, I will concentrate on the MRI findings and not uh, to speak out of track. Uh, this is uh, T1 weighted for the same patient. This is T1 weighted without contrast and T1 weighted with contrast. If you can see, there is a, a high one tense uh, mass lesion, expansile, exerting some uh, mass effect into both of the canal, also uh, in the clivus with some uh, erosion and also the cavernous sinus in both sides. Also there is a small this is a small high one tense legion in the subdural area of the left temporal lobe, which may be due to reactive or extension of the infection into the left temporal lobe. Uh, this is <coughs> Both contrast, we have also here the REM enhancement. We don't have soft tissue enhancement, just REM enhancement. And this is the maxillary uh, sinus, also this is the maxillary sinus. Here, you can see also there is enhancement of the meninges. This is most likely due to secondary meningitis. And the relationship with the, uh, here the carotid artery, carotid artery sinuses, uh, this is the optic canal, optic canal. The most important thing is this one, which is very close to the superior orbital fissure. Superior orbital fissure carries V3, uh, uh, 4, 6, and V1. Next. This is post contrast, meningitis. This is without contrast, and this is T2 weighted about the lesion. <coughs> T2 weighted, the relation with carotid artery optic canal and this is there is an obstruction with posterior and anterior ethmoid sinusitis situated. This is <coughs> flare sequence. We can see the the uh, sinusitis with a lateral recess here which reaching the optic canal. Next one. And this is the very important one is the diffusion. Diffusion gives a restrictive pattern, which indicates an infection. I mean, uh, could be an abscess. The only one which can give restrictive pattern is abscess. Next one. This is coronal, <coughs> both contrast, optic nerve, and here we have two foramen which are very important. 
the rotundum, which carries the V2, and also we have the ovea, oval, which carries V3, and uh, we have the rhythm canal. This is titulated, this is the lateral recess, titulated, titulated, this is. But we have here, very important sign, you can see there is an edema in the lower part of the frontal lobe. Here you have very tiny fluid. Next one. Edema, edema, fluid, edema, fluid. The same findings. This is sagittal T1 weighted with IV contrast. The most important thing is the ring enhancing region with the gas bubble here, which indicates an abscess in the right frontal lobe. Next one. Sagittal titulated, you have some here, there is some erosion or socialization of the uh, clivus. Here you can, uh, okay, the same, the same. Next. Uh, this is very important. You can see this is the cella, and the one, the uh, floor of the cella is intact because there is a high bone intense structure here. This is the bone. There is no extension into the pituitary gland, and this is the optic nerve. And you, I think this is free. This is the MRV normal. Just to summarize our findings, there is a, <coughs> a high intense expensive mass region in the sphenoid sinus obstructing the uh, sphenoid uh, smoidal recess with extension the tumor into the front uh, posterior ethmoid and anterior ethmoid. And there is extension of the uh, infection into the right frontal and left temporal. Also, we have a relationship of the legion with the severe orbital fissure. Thank you. The consultation with Dr. Mohamed Juma, endocrinologist. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes. Uh, from uh, endocrine point of view, I uh, was consulted to uh, evaluate pituitary if it is involved or not. Of course, here, uh, if there is any destruction in the floor of Silla Torsica, the pituitary could be involved, and we are witnessed very nasty case previous to this one with pan hypotetarism. Very, very severe pan hypotetarism. Uh, here, uh, liver enzyme, it was high, it goes with uh, infectious process, with septic process, However, we excluded also uh, specific causes of elevated liver enzymes like hepatitis and HIV. All of them were negative. Next, please. CRP was high, 175, which is very sensitive marker or indicator of the severity of uh, inflammation. It is very important. I think it is more informative than is sorry. Yes, in infection in particular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, also pituitary function test. All of them were within normal range, but uh, as you see, uh, free testosterone, it was just below the lower limit of normal. Uh, FSH, it was low. Uh, thyroid function, free T4 on the low side, TSH is normal. It goes mostly with eutyroid 6 syndrome, we call it, due to severity of infection. Sometimes we face Normal TSH, a free T4 on the low side, which we call it uh, Euth 6 syndrome. We did not give him any medication, just uh, follow. He denied any sexual problem. He did, his wife was pregnant, I think, and uh, we just give him a time for observation and to repeat uh, pituitary function later. Yes. Thank you. So, Mohammed has to read, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have a lecture here. Ask uh, one Dr. Heba Barbuti, what's she? Dr. Heba is a nephrologist, and she was asked to see the patient because of the high creatinine mm -hmm. and the hematuria and so on. Uh, 
All right, good evening. Um, so I was called to see this patient because of uh, uh, elevated serum creatinine. It was 1.7 in the previous institution or saint. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was recorded at 1.7. Um, Um, there are two components for his uh, acute kidney injury. One was uh, he was uh, volume depleted, pre-renal azotemia. And the second one was heavy use of uh, non-steroidal at the other uh, hospital. Um, so with the simple hydration and IV fluids and uh, discontinuation of all non-steroidal, he had the complete recovery of his renal function. Uh, workup included the renal imaging, which was uh, normal. And um, subsequently, he uh, recovered with the uh, um, creatine going down to one. His electrolytes were normal, and um, his urine analysis, which was uh, initially with some RBCs, also completely recovered. So can I take this, this opportunity for one statement? Um, just a few words, making use of gathering uh, different subspecialties in one room. Um, NC nephrotoxicity is not one entity. It's a spectrum of disease with different manifestations. Uh, a lot of us confuse this with uh, what we call chronic analgesic nephropathy. If he used it for three or four or seven days, how come he can get acute kidney injury from um, analgesia? He's not the prototype where you consider him as high risk for NSAIDs. He's young with no other comorbidities. But uh, I, I need to focus on um, acute kidney injury from NCA, it can cause, be caused only by hemodynamic changes, which happen in this man because of quick recovery. It can have other forms like acute interstitial nephritis. It can even cause nephrotic syndrome from membranous or glomerular nephritis. Um, and it can cause, with long term use, uh, progressive CKD and chronic analgesic nephropathy. Three points NCAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors, both are nephrotoxic. There's a lot of marketing saying COX-2 inhibitors are nephrosparing, and that's absolutely not true. It is the prostaglandin inhibition that causes nephrotoxicity, not the sodium part. And again, there's a lot of marketing. Potassium, um, uh, datlofenac potassium is less nephrotoxic than datlofenac sodium, and that's also N not true. And uh, third, um, uh, we uh, all forms of NCAIDs, whether it's IM, IV, uh, oral, sachet form, oral form, they're all nephrotoxic. So his um, risk factor was uh, prerenal azotemia and volume depletion with the use of NCAID. The typical scenario, usually elderly patient and diuretic with heavy um, use of ACE or ARB. He's not the typical person, but I think with a prolonged um, disease um, and decreased oral intake with all of what's going on here, uh, he was prone to uh, non-steroidal non nephrotoxicity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hema. Uh, thank you for uh, alluding to the uh, major problem in Jordan and Darbon, which is the use of analgesia and uh, uh, all kinds of medications without prescription. You go to the pharmacist and he will give you anything. Uh, the second thing I want to mention that I discovered just now, myself and Dr. Uh, Muhammad Arnaud, that we were in the medical school when we did, we were mentors for uh, Dr. Eba, correct? Wow. That's good. That's good. Uh, we asked Dr. Khalid Sharif team to uh, says the patient, Dr. Fawaz is here, or any of the team, no. Uh, anyway, sure. Uh, the thing was that he has no papilledema, his color vision was okay, but he has a pretty orbital swelling and toses. Dr. Ibrahim said that, are you around? Do you want to add anything? some sort of uh, cranial nerve palsy, but not really, since the motility is full with pain on extreme gazes. That 
Also, if you have many pathologies like uh, uh, swelling, uh, myopathies, whatever, but not the thing is okay till now. First of all, if I do, if I not seeing the brain space for many years, I will think that by this um, discussion or about the spinal science, that he got another ENT certificate. Um, there are two things I want to add, not about the patient, but in general. First of all, um, the solidity sin uh, um, spinosis sinus is real, but as part of band sinusitis, sinusitis is very common. And all the complications which can happen to the isolated spinoidal sinus can happen to the band sinusitis. So, uh, message to my colleagues in ENT, when you got as a band sinusitis, you should uh, clear it all. It's not enough to go for maxilla and anterior and the steroid mold and leave the spinodal sinus because it's far away. That will lead to the, all the complication which has been set here. The second thing is about the fungus. There are two way, two things about uh, uh, fungus. There is one identity which is fungus itself, which comes usually with people who have low immune um, capacity. The other one, which we call it allergic to fungus, which is far more common than the fungus itself. And these people, they should have cortisol. Because he had got a fungus a little bit in his nose, then this can cause allergy to the nose, results in polyps, mucosal infection, everything. Um, yeah, but uh, I share him the operation. So <laughs> we've been doing uh, surgery for uh, what, what, more than twenty-three years. Twenty-five years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this uh, uh, fun activity. Uh, so this patient obviously um, had signs and symptoms of infection. He did have fever. He had some meningeal uh, signs. Uh, opted to start him on cetriaxone, covering the meningeal part as well as the sinus part, uh, and flagell metronidazole covering uh, possible anaerobes uh, with that uh, air pocket uh, that we saw. Um, it's interesting, as Dr. Mahmoud alluded to, we think of invasive fungal sinusitis in immunocompromised patients. Uh, we used to see a lot of them in leukemia patients particularly acute uh, myelogenous leukemia in the setting of neutropenia. And we used to see fatal cases. Now with the advent of the modern uh, antifungals, uh, we are using them effectively for prophylaxis, and we don't see as many. Uh, the other important entity, which I might allude to in my talk, is the allergic fungal sinusitis, uh, much more commonly seen. What is this? So Aspergillus scalactomannan is uh, part of the Aspergillus uh, cell wall and we look for that uh, antigen uh, in body fluids. We can look for it in the serum, we can look for it in the CSF uh, or in the BAL uh, to give us an idea if the Aspergillus or Aspergillosis is invasive. If it is positive, it helps to make the diagnosis. If it's negative, So let me talk a little bit about sinusitis, including uh, fungal sinusitis. Uh, chronic sinusitis uh, is a condition contributed to by many factors. Um, having allergic fungal sinusitis, chronic ex exposure to irritants such as smoking, immunodeficiency states. Uh, obviously, the respiratory tract is, uh, is 
colonized normally with bacteria and fungi. And so when the body's immunity wanes enough for these to become invasive, then you get into trouble. Um, not to uh, uh, neglect some of the other conditions, defects in mucociliary clearance in cystic fibrosis patients, and systemic disorders of Wegener's, now called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, as well as eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, Schurich Strauss, and sarcoidosis. Anatomic abnormalities can be disposed to sinus obstruction and, of course, repeated surgery or iatrogenic uh, conditions. Um, allergic fungal sinusitis, if I may indulge you, um, are benign reactions to the environmental fungi. Um, there's plenty of aspergillus in Jordan. Um, obstruction provides an environment conducive for fungal growth, such as deviated septum, nasal polyps, and inflamed mucosa. So obstruction, again, uh, has been uh, focused upon many times in this lecture. What kind of fungi causes allergic fungal sinusitis? Um, in this study from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, uh, children compared with adults by Polaris, uh, had the lion's share, followed by uh, curvularia and some uh, aspergillosis. And that, I guess, uh, forces us to go back to the microbiology days. And so, um, if you wanted to place bipolaris and alternaria and corvularia, they are called dermatitious uh, molds, and they are septated, well, they have septated hyphae. Uh, Aspergillus, on the other hand, uh, has septated hyphae and again it falls under hyaline molds. These are not yeast, these are invasive molds. And this is important in uh, treatment, which we'll come to you know, very soon. So 75% of allergic fungal sinusitis is caused by uh, pheohyphomycosis and 20% uh, with aspergillus. It's an IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, most patients have a history of atopy and about half history of asthma. Uh, and typically, there's allergic mucin. Uh, you know, Dr. Mahmoud and many of the ENT people around this room have seen it. Um, under the microscope, there's this uh, charcoal-laden crystals that are seen uh, under birefractory um, microscopy or in uh, PAS and GMS stains. This is an example of somebody pro who has uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. They present with proptosis, telecanthus, and malar flattening. And why am I stressing on allergic fungal sinusitis? You get a biopsy or a swab from the nose or sinus, and bingo, there's aspergillus. Oh my god, let's go and treat the aspergillus. And it's a different uh, set of um, different ball game, really. Uh, so this is uh, another uh, at the polyps in the anterior nasal cavity uh, and were found to be allergic uh, fungal sinusitis. Uh, radiology uh, reveals a mucosal pattern, polyps, uh, and quite similar to infection, but not as invasive. So this huge mass of allergic mucin uh, was causing uh, pressure, and there's a mucosal up here in the uh, white frontal sinus. Um, extensions may go up into the anterior cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa, uh, but the orbit seems to be a favorite. And here's another example of an allergic fungal sinusitis, a uh, huge mass causing mass effect, uh, unlikely uh, cranial nerve pulses. The viscosity is a thick allergic mucin, and that's what you get. Uh, management is surgical removal, and then as stressed by Dr. Mahmoud, steroids. So you give them steroids systemically or uh, inhaled. And then you call Dr. Muhammad Bar Raoult when they get diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> He's away, right there. One, uh, one yes. Uh, about the, the allergic, to, uh, the allergic to fungus, it's said as a rule. If you have a unilateral by sinusitis, it is allergic to fungus until proved otherwise. That's important. Thank you. Um, you see from all your yes. Yes, indeed. Um, 
for the treatment part, we talked about steroids, for allergic fungal sinusitis, and I know you wanted me to comment on treatment of invasive fungal sinusitis. Uh, while uh, alpha tericin B is the gold standard, uh, I think we live in the golden age of antifungals. We have uh, really a number of new antifungals in the azole family. Uh, Voriconazole, posaconazole, and isafoconazole that all have excellent CNS penetration and they are able to kill your aspergillus. Posaconazole will kill mucor when you have invasive ranocerebral uh, mucormycosis. Um, and so we have a number of uh, azoles that are easy to use and have good CNS um, levels that we can use for medical treatment. The chemocandins are not great for this indication. Amphotericin B remains the gold standard, um, but of course, uh, only nephrologists like amphotericin B. Right, Dr. Heba? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, recurrence rate is about 6%, and I guess I'll stop here and remind you to be careful what you sniff. Uh, we asked the Tavasomation to see the patient, of course, and he announced the patient fit for surgery. We got the consent form, which is detailed one, mentioning everything and anything that is related to the patient. If he is uh, a Jordanian or an Arab, we write it in Arabic, sometimes with some expressions in English. If he doesn't speak Arabic, we write it all in English. And this is, I adopted this form from my training in England. We used to do the same. Uh, let's see the surgery. Of course, I sent to Assad, on the Assad, we have done this for so many years. We're used to each other. When I first came back from England in 1985, I used to do it from A to Z. But then I discovered I'm, I'm silly, I'm foolish to do the part that the, the ENT should do. Uh, here, Dr. Mohun Assad has led me through the nose into the base of the sphenoid. And here, as I open the floor of the base of the sphenoid, you'll get the pus coming out. This is the right nostril, the left nostril. And we get the cultures. And we send it for aerobic and anaerobic and TV and everything. Uh, when I do the surgery, I'll contact Mutasar. Mutasar, I'm going to do this. What kind of samples you want? You'll contact the lab and state exactly what he wants. This is the suction, and whatever we get the suction, we'll put it in bottles. Aerobic and anaerobic bottles are ready in theater before we start. So we do the sphenoidotomy, <coughs> we open the base of the sphenoid. This is the rostrum of the sphenoid. And now we are inside the cavity of the sphenoid science. We get samples. This is eroded bone, and we send it to Mufasa for analysis. So we send it for cultures. Look at this piece of bone, which is totally eroded. We send it for histopathology, and we send it for cultures. We need both. <coughs> so this is the cavity of the sphenoid. We don't need to do any more. Uh, this is more than enough. So we wash and wash and make sure that we don't have any residual uh, pieces. In this case we did, we find some one here. Of course you can use when you put the endoscope to see. Uh, so that's why we're saying microscopic or endoscopic. It is just the same. But the future lies in endoscopy. Cleaning and putting hydrogen peroxide and so Okay. Histology, Professor. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, <coughs> we received the uh, blood fluid, turbid, and bony pieces. Bony pieces always we have to examine them after the calcification, and the fluid we examine them for uh, different uh, uh, bacterial infection and uh, fungi. Uh, always, always, when we examine for uh, microbiology, we do 
uh, abandoned offsets at least should it include BS10, BS10 uh, just to enlighten you for the people that are not used to this uh, we use it to stain for fungi but also stains for parasites GMS stain is another stain that stains for fungi and uh, sometimes uh, we use both or almost of the time we use both because some of the fungi they stain either of them not all of them not all fungi stain both uh, then we stain we stain them uh, for acid fast bacilli. Uh, we use sometimes gene stain, stain also some parasites. And I don't like to use, sometimes we you have to use gram stain. I don't like to use gram stain in tissue because so many artifacts have been in the tissue. So uh, I don't like to stain it, but we stain usually we don't work when we do it in the fluid. Uh, in this case, uh, I don't like to comment on the type of the uh, organism if for a bacterial organism on gram stain alone, I think it has always to be accompanied by culture because it gives you a false uh, positive things. You can see it's um, the tissue is uh, mostly fat tissue and there's a lot of inflammatory cells. Uh, the most important thing to call something osteomyelitis is to find plasma cells and there's plenty of them here. Uh, you can see them. Plasma cells usually they have eccentric nuclei uh, and is an ophelic site to blast. Uh, very important when you want to call it stomylitis to find the plasma cells. Uh, this is another area. Uh, this I think BS stain was negative. There was no uh, fungi in this. This is another area we can see many areas of uh, plasma cells <coughs> uh, and sheath of plasma cells. This is different that this is an osteomyelitis and there is no malignancy. Uh, sometimes you see osteoclast this is not granuloma, this is osteoclast because of the destruction of the bone sometimes and this is usual and there are so many plasma cells also there. So we call this uh, acute on top of chronic osteomyelitis, uh, no fungi or parasite seen. Uh, just a few uh, moment, moment, uh, minutes about uh, osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis can be um, rich osteomyelitis with so many plasma cells but sometimes can be really difficult. We can call it fibrosing osteomyelitis chronic fibrosis tonight and you see rarely or rare plasma cells but it's very important to look for them sometimes we use uh, CD138 which is a immune staining to highlight plasma cells that are hidden so it's very important sometimes to see them especially it is the chronic fibrosing osteomyelitis uh, we, you mentioned something as a pathologist I want to comment on the inset uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory uh, I think many people they don't know uh, because we see this as a pathologist you don't see them uh, as a clinician uh, in, unless you are in the GI we see them not not in ulcers of course they cause gastric ulcers but they cause they cause microscopic colitis and many people that are addicted to insects uh, will develop over the time especially collagenous colitis they alter the uh, uh, synthesis of the collagen in the colon so we can cause collagen colitis to be careful, it not only has nephrotoxicity, but also has colonic toxicity. Thank you. So this is the muscle. It's acute on top of chronic osteomyelitis. And these are the cultures that followed. Blood culture, urine culture, Z. Nelson, Lamstein, Swell culture, <coughs> Tutococcus veridens. And here the same thing. May I comment on these Please. bacteria? Yes. So these are oral bacteria. Streptheridens in particular is a group of oral bacteria found in the teeth, gingiva. So this patient had an infection with oral bacteria. Threridens group strep has many uh, species and they cause gingivitis and other uh, orally related infections. Okay. Oral bacteria usually are present in the skin. It's a normal flora. So I don't know what's the significance of finding or writing in it because probably this is contamination from the skin. Sure. Uh, as the professor just mentioned, we stated the Rosfer and Kanji and Guillaume. We discharged him because he was well, and this is our discharge summary. Again, the usual flimsy, simple two lines discharge summary is not acceptable anymore. It is not. Although it is in every hospital in Jordan, this flimsy piece of the sarsomy. Patient admitted to the so-and-so, the so-and-so, was done, discharged, 
Okay, no information for the patient or relatives or any other doctor. So you should have something like this. And I keep saying, this is somebody is started on admission. Once the patient has admitted, you put his history. Once the lab results come, they put them inside. The x-rays, results, and then what happens, the consultations, the treatment, and everything. Again, this is not my invention. This is how I was trained in England to do such disassemblies. Follow up, six months. He went back to Norway to his wife and kids. As I said, he's residing there as a graphic designer. And I asked him to come over to see him. He was doing well. And this is his uh, mother, look at this. And here's the computer. He, he designed this uh, himself. He designed the radiology. <laughs> no. <laughs> and here he is. He gave me a book about the uh, rhymes and hymns in uh, Norway, which was very, very nice. At the same period, in the same month, we had this Iraqi patient with multiple trend in the sixth, third, and V2. And look at this. Yes. This is the one that Dr. Juman alluded to. He had pan hypopotitis. Again, we did the surgery for him. This is what it looked like, and he recovered completely. Uh, with this, I finish, and I thank you very much, and I'm open for discussions and comments. So, as uh, Rahim, you mentioned at the beginning, you mentioned at the beginning that this disease is mainly in far eastern people, it's and they are, it's, it's more common, let's say. And you presented most of the papers are either from Korea, Turkey, India, and Egypt. Sure, it is there every country. But why is that? Is that is there something in the yeah, structure, so or wh why? It is just the atmosphere, the humidity. Is it humidity yes. or the humidity, physique? Humidity, humidity in the Far East and in the Middle East. But it is present in every country. It is now. Yeah. I'd like to ask Dr. Salah Aish, do you have any comment, any taliq? تعليقي انه هذه الجلسه دسمه من العلم رائعه جدا تخلد لك في الاردن انت الوحيد الذي تقابله نعم شكرا لك بالنسبه للساينوسايتس اتس مور كومن ان يوروب لان عشت هناك وعشت هنا فار كومن فور بوليتس ديير ابا انه لسه هير اند the polyps, uh, now they say most of it are uh, immunity or <coughs> in, in allergic to fungus. So it's uh, very common there. Yeah. Uh, the major complaint of the patient who referred to us uh, in the radiology department for MRI or CT scan is headache. Uh, so we found, uh, we find a uh, lot of patients, they have sinusitis or uh, sinus involvement by uh, either sinusitis or uh, allergy or pan-sinusitis. And uh, sometimes we mention if it is very important, if it is small mucoperiosteal taking in, sometimes also we, we co consider that in our diagnosis. ENT specialists, they, sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't like it. So, uh, 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 I, I think that sphenoid sinus uh, is very important to be mentioned. Uh, sometimes ethmoid sinusitis or frontal sinusitis, if it is mild, so it is not import, very important uh, for the patient. But spheroid sinusitis is very important because, uh, as we saw here in this lecture or sometimes in our practical uh, life, we see sometimes it has very, very bad complication. Uh, I uh, want to ask from Dr. Mahmoud Asad, uh, when, if there is uh, spheroid sinusitis or pan sinusitis with multiple polypoid lesions, and very bad sinusitis. When you go to surgery for this uh, for this patient first, and uh, second, most of the patient 
they come to us twice and three times, four times, they don't uh, cure with medication. So what is, when, when you go to surgery for this patient? Indications for surgery. First of all, if it is acute, we have you have to give him some sort of medication, okay, according to what you find. In the chronic, there is no um, uh, pre-operative and management is wrong. <coughs> Usually, the post-operative is important. Now, you have to differentiate between a chronic non-polypoid sinusitis and uh, polypoid sinusitis with polyps, okay. But first, I would like to uh, comment on your a question about the small. Now, uh, MRI, if we going to depend on MRI, most of the people, they have a lot of sinusitis, which is for us, because it's not differentiated, the bony margin, so it will give you bad impression that it is a sinusitis. So we depend mainly on CT. Now, CT, if it is all around, mucosal thickening, this is part of, uh, and the doctor, like me or others, he will look at the uh, examination of the nose, and if he find that there is a hypertrophic terminate, so it must be for the sinuses to be hypertrophic, because it's the same mucosa. So what's affecting the mucosa of the nose is going to affect the mucosa of the sinuses. So we don't consider this as sinusitis. We consider it as part of nasal sinusitis, which is need to be either allergic or vasomotor or whatever it is. That, that's the why sometimes we don't uh, look at, uh, you know, the, the report a lot or take a wait for what reporting. So the, this is the uh, answer, doctor. Now, for the polyps, we should surgically remove it and then. We send it for uh, to find out if he really there is allergy by RGE, by RAS test, by press test, whatever there is. So you can find the allergy, the, the allergic reason, and then you treat it accordingly, either by desensitization or removal or anything like that. But to just give, give him the medication before, it's not going to him. Now some people, which is unfair, they give him a lot of cortisone before, and then he dis he gets very well within one week, two weeks, three weeks, and then he come back more, and also a person like hypertension or uh, something like that. So we advise removal and then go for treatment. Surgery is not the, the only treatment for chronic sinusitis with polyps. Um, uh, surgery is, can be enough for the chronic sinusitis without polyps. Okay. Have you seen any cases in your practice of mucosils or the synod causing endocrine problems? No. have you seen potential cases of sinusitis? Maybe, maybe one or two, but it is in your domain or in the domain we depend a lot on radiology, really. Diagnosis is not really clinical. So you don't blame the pediatrician, you blame my friend here on my right. Thank you very much. Just to mention that the role of MRI in diagnosis of fungal infection. During the treatment, there is a jet black of the sinuses, which is both like an air. Uh, this is diagnostic of uh, uh, fungal infection. Can you enumerate what are the drugs that would cause uh, renal problems? Enjoy. That, that's a, a one-hour answer, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I, I have to I have to say NSAID would be the number one abuse medications. Um, I've talked to many uh, pharmacists, colleagues, and, and, and they they give me a staggering number of. Voltast and Voltaren gel and Voltaren uh, tablets prescribed on a daily basis. I have to say, in Sorry, what about the Voltaren patch? Very good patch? question. So there is a minor transdermal absorption. So in someone with low risk normal creatinine, I would allow it completely. 
with advanced CKD stage 3 and above, it's absolutely contraindicated. So correct. And transdermal, correct. What about anti acids? Uh, so, um, uh, anti acids, which are either H2 blockers or PPIs, H2 blockers have not been implicated in um, AKI or CKD, but PPIs proton pump inhibitors, which we overuse and abuse. Um, prescriptions are written on discharge with no instructions when to discontinue. So a lot of our patients would con co consider it one of his chronic medications with absolutely no indication. Um, PPIs can cause progressive CKD, and that's biopsy proven. They can cause hypocalcemia. They can cause hyponatremia. So they're not innocent medications. What about antibiotics? I mean, uh, there are more nephrotoxic uh, antibiotics compared to other. Um, so any antibiotic can cause AKI as an idiosyncratic re reaction or acute interstitial nephritis. Of course, notorious are aminoglycosides um, uh, in terms of nephrotoxicity, but overused quinidones. Quinidones are the first reaction when someone gets uh, URI or dysuria. Quinidones can cause acute interstitial nephritis and rising creatinine. So um, I, I want to re-emphasize the COX-2 inhibitors because many of my ortho colleagues yeah, gave ortho stating that this is safe on the kidneys. They're not safe on the kidneys and they're not safe on the stomach even, which was actually the initial reason why they were um, created. Um, sparing the COX-1, which is mainly in the GI, but still it can cause uh, GI toxicity. Thank you very much. So Farah, ophthalmologist, have you seen cases presenting to you with mucosine? I have seen some, but they're in England, not here. First, uh, did you teach the Torah? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <coughs> I've seen uh, a few in, uh, in England, in Liverpool, my hospital, but uh, here I didn't see them. Any comment from any member of the audience? Please. So, uh, when I was a GP, I don't know, I want to ask Victor on that also. In case of uh, sinusitis, whether it is acute or a little bit sub-acute, uh, we were giving vancomycin for six or seven days, the, the, those days. I don't know now if it is eff uh, effective or not. It's effective for Victor Heber. Yeah, it's, it's, it keeps it's, you busy, right? Yeah. Dr. Montazer, you know, is uh, better than me, but in uh, in my experience in the in international uh, lectures and conference, um, in uh, Britain, they you like to give levofloxacin or the uh, Camelot. In the uh, America, they like to give uh, the um, amoxicillin or plus acid. So. Everybody is, um, you know, claim that this is the best choice for treatment for root sinusitis. We are close by saying that uh, what you have said is very accurate. It depends on the country that you're treating. In Norway, you use amoxicillin. Uh, in the United States, fluoroquinolones. In Jordan, either or, perhaps sometimes um, macrolides. Um, Obviously not vancomycin. Vancomycin is a toxic drug that belongs to the Middle Ages. It would be a borderline malpractice to use it for sinusitis. <laughs> Although good for, again, our friend. <laughs> any questions, any comments? Thank you. With this, we finish, and I thank you. We'll meet next week.